questions I'd like you to ask yourself, just in the quietness of your own heart and your own mind, ask yourself this simple question. Do I delight in the Lord? Do I delight in the Lord? Notice I didn't ask you if you believe in Him. I hope that's true. Even the demons do that and shudder. Neither did I ask you, are you committed to the Lord? That's a good thing, to be committed to the Lord. My question for you this morning, though, is a different one. It's a deeper one. My question is, do you delight in God? Is He, is God, uppermost in your affections? Is He your greatest joy? Is the Lord your truest and deepest love? I think that's an appropriate question, first and foremost, because it's a question that's near and dear to God's heart, you know, the whole first love thing. And also, it's practically speaking, a question that comes to bear upon us as we are in the middle of a sermon series where we're asking this question over and over as a family of faith. How does this, how does Scripture shape our singing? How does the Bible inform how we praise our God? And, and, and so we started with the why of, of biblical singing and then the how of biblical singing. And, and, and we've recently been working through different types of songs that we encounter in Scripture. Last week, we talked about songs of lament. And we gave everybody a pill as they left uh, to lift them up out of the dungeon. We didn't do that, sorry. Um, <laughs> Songs of Lament, we learned as we, as we had our Bibles open, gosh, not every faithful song is a happy song. As a matter of fact, a third of the Psalms in the Bible, the songbook of Israel, are Psalms of Lament. Sometimes the, the Lord uses our sad songs and seasons to grow us and to shape us into his image and likeness. And, and this week, I hope you don't get whiplash, we're, we're going to pull a 180. We're going to go from lament to delight. And I hope you'll see, as we have our Bibles open, that the, that the scriptures are just brimming over with examples of songs that express delight, that express adoration and affection to God for who he is and what he's done. Now, on a personal note, on a very practical note, these songs of delight that we'll be looking at this morning can be pretty revealing. I, I think they can really serve, these songs of delight, as a sort of diagnostic tool for our hearts. What do you mean by that, Zeb? A diagnostic tool for your hearts. Have you ever had, ever had a diagnosis at the doctor's office or perhaps at the, uh, at the auto body shop? A diagnosis of the heart. I'm, I'm convinced that these songs of delight can be kind of like that for us. One of the ways, it's certainly not the only way, but one of the ways that we as followers of Jesus can test the temperature of our heart's affection for God is to see how we respond when we encounter one of these truths, one of these scriptural songs of delight does your heart lean in to those truths and latch on to them or does it sort of skip over them with a spiritual yawn i believe these really help us diagnose where our hearts are before the lord as we encounter them in scripture and friend you don't have to go very far in scripture to find examples of these kinds of songs, these songs of delight. In fact, the sheer number of songs in Scripture that just offer praise and adoration and delight to God for who He is are, are just innumerable. It's a bit overwhelming. And so this morning, rather than just take you on a crazy uh, train and, and, and air out a laundry list of song of delight after song of delight, I'm just going to share with you four simple little excerpts, four little nuggets from some of my favorite songs of delight to whet your appetite and to help you see, oh yeah, this is just knit 
throughout the testimony of Scripture. Let me uh, start with one that I think is just so powerful, so beautiful. And by the way, uh, because I'm going rapid fire here with some of these, uh, I can save your grumbling, and we're just going to put these songs up on the screen. Uh, when we get to where we're going to camp out a little bit later, uh, we'll, we'll have you looking in your Bibles for that. So you can write, write these down if you like, if they minister to your heart, to meditate on them later. But I'm just going to start with Psalm 63 verse 3. Get this. The psalmist is singing now. This is a, a, a lyric from a song. And he sings to the Lord, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. Now this isn't spiritual hyperbole, friends. The psalmist really believes that God's love, that his hesed, we talked about that word a lot lately, his loyal love, his, his faithfulness in our lives, his steadfast love is so good. It's so sweet. It is dearer. It is more precious to him than, than life itself. And note here in Psalm 63 what the response of such a great love is. A, so, a love that's better than life. The psalmist bubbles over with more song. My lips will praise you because you're so good. You see it here? A song of delight. Let, let's, uh, let's take another one. Psalm 103, verse 1. Another song of delight in, in Scripture. Now, I dare you to try to read this without any kind of affection whatsoever for the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. It doesn't work. You can't, you can't do it. Not faithfully, at least. The psalmist is crying out, Lord, bless you. My whole soul blesses your name. Everything that I've got, everything within me, bless your holy name. You see the delight just dripping from this song. There's, there's another one I'll share with you. This is a very familiar one, perhaps to many of you. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing, just one, this, this single-minded thing, have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I want to be where He is the psalmist sings to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Last one. Psalm 16, verse 2. One of my favorites. Psalm 16, verse 2. I say to the Lord, that's Yahweh, Lord in all caps. I say to Yahweh, you are my Adonai. You are my Lord. Apart from you, God, I have no good thing. That's one translation. The ESV renders it, I have no good apart from you. Translation, God, all of my good is wrapped up in who you are. I mean, you see this? It's beautiful. And it is just so apparent that uh, running throughout the pages of the Psalms, certainly in Scripture at large, are these songs of delight. Songs where the people of God are just captivated, enraptured by who God is. And spilling out from those truths, from that reality, is a song of praise to God. We sing to the Lord for many reasons. But today, we're focusing on how God's people sing to him as an overflow of their joy and delight in his person. Now, some of you are tracking fairly easily. Perhaps you, you go to church here or somewhere else, and this is just sort of old hat for you. You're kind of nodding your spiritual head thinking, okay, I got it, Zeb. But here's my issue. Here's the issue that... Sometimes I struggle with this desire as it relates to my relationship with God. If this, if this is you, if this is something that you struggle with, knowing that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, knowing that there should be nothing sweeter in your life than who He is, but struggling to, to walk that out, then here I think the Scriptures too prescribe a way forward. 
Here's one way for you to help yourself delight in the Lord. Ready for it? Sing your way there. That's it. I mean, I don't know what you were expecting, but the Bible invites you, follower of Yahweh, follower of Jesus Christ, to sing your way to delight when you're struggling to walk in it. Some of you are saying, wait a minute, Zeb, that's kind of like a circular argument. I just told you that I was struggling with delighting in the Lord. I was struggling with singing. Yeah, I got that. Do it anyway. That's the testimony of Scripture. Do it anyway. You've got to sing your way there. Why? Well, because biblical delight is more than a feeling. Should I say that again? Biblical delight is more than an emotion. It's bigger than your feelings. So when you're numb, and when you're walking through pain, what you believe about your God needs to be rehearsed. It needs to be resung, even when you don't feel it sometimes. You sing your way to delight. Let me give you a biblical example. If I'm making a claim, I better be able to back it up, right? With, with our source of truth, with Scripture. Here's Psalm 42, verse 11. The psalmist sings an interesting lyric here. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? And then he sings the answer to himself. Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. What's happening here? What's the psalmist doing? He's singing to his soul. You know, sometimes, friend, that's what you need to do. We sing to the Lord. He's the primary audience. But sometimes you need to preach to yourself. I do. Sometimes you need to sing to yourself. Remember, soul, where your comfort is found. Where your hope resides. You sing your way to delight. In times of both joy and sorrow, we praise our King and our Savior because He is our first and greatest love. All right, I, I hope this is, uh, this is simple. I hope this is uh, low-hanging fruit for you here. Uh, but, but we see all throughout Scripture these songs of delight that emanate, that bubble over out of a right understanding, a right relationship with the living God. So for the remainder of our time this morning, what I simply want to do is just walk you through one. And you've already heard it. I should have asked him to sing it. Sam was up here reading through the entirety of Psalm 84. This is a beautiful picture, friends, of a biblical song that is just saturated with delight. Turn to Psalm 84, if you will. I'm done putting things up on the screen because uh, screen, we're going to camp out here. I need your Bibles in your lap. Let's get them open on your devices because everything we're going to say is going to be grounded right here. By the way, we've ordered some additional Bibles to go under those chairs. If you, if you don't have a Bible, a faithful translation of the Bible, and you need one, that is our gift to you. They're little hardback, black ESV Bibles. We've got other translations if you're interested. We do not believe here at Friendship Community Church that there's only one faithful English translation, but practically speaking, we preach from the ESV, and so that's the one we've got for you to follow along with uh, here. So, so that's our gift to you if you don't have a Bible, but Psalm 84, let Let's work our way quickly through it with an eye toward this theme of biblical delight. As we begin to, to breach the hill to this beautiful psalm, Psalm 84, it's helpful for you to know, I think, that this is a song that was meant to be sung in transit. You know, God's people, several times a year, three, uh, for the men of, of Israel, were required by the biblical Levitical law to go up to Jerusalem. You always went up to Jerusalem, going up the mountain, going up to the place where God was. 
And as they would travel from all corners of the nation of Israel up to Jerusalem, to where the temple or the tabernacle, depending upon when it was, was housed, to, to worship God there, where the Holy of Holies was, the, the Ark of the Covenant, as you went up to worship, God's people would sing to prepare their hearts to meet with God. Imagine that. God's people would sing to prepare their hearts to meet with God. Why do we sing when we come together every Sunday morning? Because part of what we're doing is just giving glory to Him because He's worthy of it. Part of what we're doing is we're preparing our hearts to encounter Him through His Word. God's people are singing as they're traveling to Jerusalem. So you could say in a way, there are these songs in Scripture, sometimes called pilgrim songs, that are effectively, I don't know, in our English vernacular today, like road trip songs, right? You got some road trip music you just throw on? These, these were the, the road trip songs of Israel as they were going to meet with God. And this is one of them. You'll notice because these people are going to the place of worship, going to encounter God, an emphasis on location here in this song. The, the psalm starts off longing for a place, longing for the courts of the Lord. And, and as they go up later in the psalm, we'll see specific locations are highlighted. They're traveling through the, the valley of Baca, for instance. We'll get to that uh, in, in a moment. Make note also, before we start reading here, the first lyric of Psalm 84, make a mental note of the author. This is really important. We're going to circle back to this at the end. Make a note of who wrote the psalm, those sons of Korah. And again, we'll, we'll circle back there before we end. All right, let's, let's dive in. It's time. We've been circling the wagon long enough. I think we'll see as we begin to work our way quickly, not exhaustively, but just quickly thematically looking for delight in Psalm 84, uh, that, that this is just uh, plastered, the theme of delight plastered throughout. 84 verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling pe uh, place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Let's stop there for a moment. I want you to see this language that's being used here is really the language of Hebrew love poetry. How lovely is your dwelling place. That word lovely is literally the word beloved. It would have been the word that was used in like love poems that were written between people at that particular time. How lovely, how beloved God is, is your courts, is your dwelling place. Is it just that they're, they're caught up in the architecture of God's temple? No. They're, they're delighting in God's place, the place where God dwells because He's there and his presence makes it beautiful, makes it lovely. And, and he really turns up the heat after this uh, lovely comment too, doesn't he? He goes from how lovely, how beloved is your place, God, to this deep, intense soul longing. Look at this language. My soul longs, even faints. My goodness, I'm feeling a little bit convicted. When was the last time you were like ready to faint at the prospect of appearing before the living God, of, of coming before him in worship? Friends, have you ever wanted something so bad that you were nearly delirious? I'm talking dizzy. It, it was physically impacting you. Maybe a headache or sweaty palms. Can you relate, friend? I'm sure some of you can. You got the same skin that I do, to feeling overwhelmed with longing for something. For some of us, that something can even kind of move into an unhealthy realm. I'll just talk straight for a minute. Some of us know what it feels like to be overwhelmed with sexual desire, You're physically impacting us. Some of us know what it feels like to be so overwhelmed with longing or desire, perhaps for a drug or a drink or a medication, maybe food. 
Stop looking at me like that. You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Some of us know this feeling all too well. When it feels like we're about to come unglued, we just can't stop thinking, we can't stop fixating on something. This is the language of Psalm 84. God, my soul yearns for you. I'm going I'm to pass out, Lord. Help me. I just want to meet with you so badly. Now, now, don't miss the point here, friends. I'm just, just plain. What is this intense longing producing? What is the response of these sons of Korah at the end of verse 2? It's music, isn't it? At a birth from this place of yearning, of longing to be with the Lord... The response is my heart, that's my inmost being, and my flesh, that's his body, sing for joy to the living God. You know what we're talking about? Part of the reason we do this is so that we would delight in who God is. Is This is biblical. This isn't hyperbole. hyperbole. This isn't like super Christian level. It's just in the Bible. When we learn to see the goodness of God for what it truly is. I often cite that old hymn. You know, some of you know it. The, the things of the world will grow strangely dim. When you really see his goodness and grace. The light of his goodness and grace for what it is. All right. Let's keep moving. Verse 3. Psalm 84, verse 3. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. I don't know about you, but I've had this experience. Are you ever reading through the Psalms or reading through a part of Scripture and you catch a line and you're like, where did that come from? Right? One moment, the psalmist is just delighting, almost fainting at the presence of God. And then he's singing about birds. Right? I'm like, where did the birds come from? Here's the point. God's presence is not just reserved for the prominent or for the powerful. This is good news for you and me. Although God is described here in this verse, verse 3, as the Lord of hosts. The, the literal Hebrew here is Jehovah Sabaoth or Yahweh Sabaoth. It means the Lord of armies, the Lord's of, Lord of hosts or hordes. This is getting at the power of God. In view of God's power and high holiness, the psalmist turns and starts singing about how he is also, despite his strength and power, he is a refuge for the humble, for the insignificant, even the humble sparrow. Doesn't get much more humble than that, does it? Jesus takes up the same imagery, doesn't he, in Matthew 10? Talking about how God Almighty even sees, even knows the sparrows. He feeds them. He knows when everyone falls. And the point is clear. If God Almighty, if if Jehovah Sabaoth, if the Lord of hosts sees the sparrows, if there's a, a place for the swallow nest in his courts, how much more so, friend, for you? He is a high God, and he stoops to meet with his people. He stoops down low to commune with you and me. Let's keep reading. Verses 4 and and 5. The psalmist continues singing, Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed, he repeats, are those whose strength is in you, in whose hearts are the highways to Zion. Here we have two beatitudes in these verses. A double blessing. That's what blessed is. It's the word happy. Blessed. Same, same word derived in, in Matthew 5 where Jesus is just airing out the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed, the sons of Korah sing, are those who get to dwell all the time in God's house. He's talking here in verse 4 about the priests 
who would just live in the courts of the, of the Lord and serve him all the time. Oh, how blessed that would be to have that reality, to have that nearness, that proximal nearness to the Lord at all times. And then he turns, he says, blessed also are those who find their strength in God. They're so fixed on being in God's presence. In fact, that I love the second part of verse 5, in their hearts are highways. How does that work? In their hearts are the highways to Zion. I think some of you know, uh, you've experienced what this is like. My family's about to, to travel up to New York, upstate New York, uh, where I grew up on 250 acres. Uh, we don't make it up there often. It's just so far away. Like the southwestern corner of PA to the northeastern corner of New York is like almost 10 hours. With a brood of kids like ours, that's, a lo- that's like whatever that is, like seven days. <laughs> you know what happens when I'm driving home? closer that I get, I begin to, to relish the memory of these turns as I negotiate them, and memories start flooding back. I'm thinking about now these moments and places of my childhood. In my heart are highways to New York, upstate New York, the city's something else. God's got me here. This is home now, but that will always have a special place in my heart. There will always be highways to home for me. You know, for God's people, the psalmist sings here in Psalm 84, 5, there are highways in their heart to the place where they go to meet with God. Isn't that beautiful? Well-worn paths, because they go there often, and they relish the journey. The paths to worship are etched in their hearts. Let's keep reading verses 6 and 7. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Now, something that may be helpful for you to know geographically The Valley of Baca. We don't know exactly where this valley was, but we know from from the word and from the inference here that that this valley was a dry, waterless place. The Valley of Baca was a hard place. And yet, as the faithful sing along the highways to Zion, and they're passing through this hard, barren place, this Valley of Baca. They sing there too. You remember Psalm 23, don't you? Yea, though I walk around the valley of the shadow of death. That's not how it goes. Sometimes the good shepherd will lead his people through. Though I walk right through the middle of the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes when you're headed to Zion, when you set your heart to worship the Lord, on this side of the sun, we got to walk through some dry places, don't we? God will make us walk through the valley of Baca to get there. But the end goal is so sweet. The presence of God is so good. It's so worth it that they're singing along the way. In fact, they're making this dry place a place of springs, a place of water. I'm learning to appreciate the the second half of that verse more and more and more as I'm getting closer and closer to the big 4-0. They go from strength to strength. Some of you are laughing. You're like, 40. I got like a couple more months, right? Let's, let's leave it in the 30s for now. Strength to strength. This is what we're talking about. Strength to strength. Look at verse 5. Or excuse me, verse 7. I just want to point out for you that this is not natural. When you're beginning a journey, do you go from strength to more strength? No, that's not the way it works. On a long journey, you begin with strength and you end with exhaustion, don't you? 
But not if you're going to meet with the Lord, the psalmist sings. Not, not if you're headed toward the presence of God. You're so compelled by what's on the other end of that valley that you go from strength to more strength. I see this in the lives of faithful saints who have walked with Jesus a long time and faithfully. I'm beginning to learn that it actually doesn't get easier as you get older. By the way, um, teenagers, kids in the room, you think you're going to get it figured out when you grow up? Just buckle up. <laughs> it keeps getting harder. It keeps getting more complicated. But here's what happens. As you walk with Jesus, you begin to see in these faithful saints of God, if they are regularly singing songs of delight to Him, and finding joy and comfort in His presence, that although life gets only harder as they get older, there's a greater sweetness, there's a greater strength and sanctification that happens. They go from strength to more strength, even through the Valley of Baca. We've got to keep going. Verses 8 and 9, let's keep reading here. O oh Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. Hear my prayer, the psalmist sings. By the way, you know that prayers can be both sung and spoken. That's what we're doing when we're singing here. We're praying. We're, we're singing out our prayers to God. And as the psalmist here, as the songs of Korah are singing their prayer, they turn their prayer toward the king. They start to pray. They start to sing about the king, the shield, the protector of the nation of Israel. Although he didn't always do a good job, did he? They're asking for their authority. Lord, look, look on your anointed one. Those that you've anointed and, and lifted up in these positions of leadership. I love how Jim just a moment ago prayed for the leaders of our nation. We're instructed to do that, aren't we? regardless of whether we line up behind them or not, they are the Lord's anointed. Every authority set up in, on the earth in every stripe and form of it has been instituted by God. I mean, we always agree, but that means we pray and we trust God through what He has ordained. Now, for us, as New Testament, uh, New Testament believers, for, uh, for us on this side of the cross, this anointed language takes on a more sweet and precious tone, doesn't it? Doesn't it? The word anointed, that's, that's where we get our word Messiah from. That's what Messiah means, the anointed one. We get from that the word Christ Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. Christ is his title. He is Jesus. It means literally Jesus the anointed one. Look to your anointed one, God. Jesus shows up and he says all this, all this back stuff, all this early part of the Bible, this old test, it's all about me. All the law and the prophets, it's fulfilled in me. Sons of Korah are singing about the anointed one, and so do we, don't we? About Jesus, who ransomed us from sin and death, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I don't know about you, uh, although I am compelled by Scripture to pray for the governing authorities, my hope isn't in them. My hope is in the capital A anointed one, in Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. And you better believe the Lord has set his face upon him. Now here, we, here we've made it to verse 10. And he, wow. This is good stuff. For a day in your courts, the sons of Korah sing, is better. It's just better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Just pause for a minute, because this might be familiar language to you. Some of you are singing it in your head, aren't you? 
Don't let the familiarity for some of you steal the power of what's happening in this verse. This is an absolutely astounding statement. This is a mind-boggling lyric. The, the Bible just said that one day in the presence of God, one day in the courts of the Lord, is better than a thousand days you pick where else. Does that work anywhere else in life? Of course it doesn't. Notice that he's not just saying that it's better to be with God than it is anywhere else. He's not just saying that. He's not just saying one day with God is better than one day anywhere else. No, he's look at the scale. This is one day, one 24-hour period with God in his courts. Then a, a thousand days. Do the math. That's like two and a half years. We're Pittsburghers. Better is one day before the Lord worshiping in his presence than a thousand days and two and a half years living at Kennywood. Or pick your place. That is seriously better. Would you agree? That's like next level better, this comparison. You, you've heard the old adage, some of you haven't yet, that, uh, that a bad day fishing is better than a good day in the office. Well, the psalmist sings that on steroids. One day in your presence, God, is more desirable, is better to me. And any amount of time elsewhere, thousand days elsewhere, just a little bit of time with him, then unlimited amount of time anywhere else. And, and notice this as well. Notice as we're looking at verse 10 now, that delighting in God's presence will change your ambitions. Delighting in God's presence will change your priorities. What's he say? The second part of verse 10, better to be a doorkeeper. Now, what do you think? Is that a high, exalted position? Mm -mm. Better to be a lowly, humble doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell. That means live. I just took that thing out, didn't I? Than to dwell in the, in the tents of the wicked. This was a nomadic society. They, they lived in tents. Give me a humble, lowly position where I'm next to God, where I'm in His presence, over the most exalted position possible. Give me the humble place with my God, my King, than the lap of luxury anywhere else. I love how C.H. Spurgeon puts it. Spurgeon writes, I think I got this quote up here. I can send it to you if you'd like. The lowest station in the Lord's house is better than the highest position among the godless. To bear burdens and open doors for the Lord is more honor than to reign among the wicked. Every man has his choice and this is ours. Listen, God's worst is better than the devil's best. Isn't that good? God's worst is better than the devil's best. You start walking with the Lord, Christian, you start following Jesus, He will begin to rewire your priorities and your ambitions. Or He ought to, if you're following Him with a whole heart, if you're delighting in Him first, God really is better. That's what the psalmist is saying. Let's finish it out. Verses 11 and 12. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Finally, the psalm ends. This song of delight ends with this crescendo of a blessing. This is the, the last of three beatitudes in Psalm 84. The last blessing statement. They sing, these songs of Korah sing, I'll tell you who's blessed, verse 12. I'll tell you who's happy. It's the one who trusts in the Lord of hosts. So, in a way, the song ends right where it started. 
with delight. Delight in the presence of the king. Now, I told you that we were going to circle back to that author, right? Let's end there. I want to ask, who is singing such a beautiful song? Who are these sons of Korah? Now, if you know your Bible, you've read through your Old Testament, and you've been paying attention, something about that name should be ringing a bell. Korah. Korah. We don't have time now to go back and read it, but I just want to, I want to ask you, if you're unfamiliar with this, to go reread number 16 this week. Number 16. We're introduced, this is a sad story, to a group of rebels. God has rescued his people from bondage in Egypt. God has split the sea in two. He's raining manna down from the sky to keep them alive as they go to, to the land of milk and honey. He's been so good to them. And yet God's people start to grumble. And there's three hot shots. Dathan, Abiram, and one more. Want to take a wild guess at his name? Korah. Korah. And they begin to grumble against the Lord. And they begin to grumble against the, the uh, leadership structure that he's put in place under Moses and Aaron. And God, I'm not making this up. Go read number 16. This is in your Bible. God opens the ground to swallow them up. They and all who rebelled against him and his leadership closes the earth over top of them. Sends a fire and a plague to judge his people for their unfaithfulness. You know what they call that rebellion in number 16? They call it Korah's rebellion. Everyone who rebelled against the Lord was killed. Many of the family members of these unfaithful men of Korah but we learn later that God spared the sons of Korah. Think about this. Not only did God spare the sons of that rebel, He, he spared them not just to like go sit in the corner, right? I guess you can still be alive. I guess you can still be part of the people of Israel. Just sit over there and shut up. Until you've earned your way back into my good graces. No, God not only spares the sons of Korah, He sets them apart as choice instruments for His praise. In fact, maybe you recognize some of the words of the sons of Korah, inspired by the Holy Spirit, carried on through millennia by God's people as we sing them. It was the sons of Korah who wrote that familiar phrase, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul longs for you, O oh God. Psalm 42, sons of Korah. It was the sons of Korah, that rebel, who, who write, God is our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in time, of trouble, Psalm 46. It was the sons of Korah who wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Be still and know that I am God. And here in Psalm 86, the sons of that wicked man, in praise and delight to God Almighty, sing, Better is one day with you, God than a thousand anywhere else. I want to leave you with that. What's this mean for us here at Friendship Community Church in 2022? Well, it certainly means this. Out of the line of the wicked, God can and does graciously set apart and raise up those who will echo His praises. Some of you are living proof of that right here, aren't you? 
out of a legacy of shame and sin and pain. Maybe it was your family. Maybe it was your own mess that you made. And yet here you are, saved by grace through faith in Jesus, singing to the praise of the King. God takes the sons of Korah and uses them as His choice instruments to get glory. Don't you dare think for one moment, friend, that He can't use you. May we be a people at Friendship Community Church that sings the song of Psalm 84. Better is one day in your courts, God, and any, any amount of time anywhere else than thousands elsewhere. And I can't think of a more appropriate way to close than to sing it. So I'm going to pray, and Ruth Ann's going to come up and lead. Father, we thank you for this truth, this reminder from these faithful songs, these songs of delight, that you're just better, God. You're better than the fool's gold that the world has to offer. Teach us, God, to lean into your goodness. Teach us, God, to sing songs, whether we're walking through the dry and barren valley of Baca, or whether we're drinking from the sweet springs of life that you've provided, Lord, we pray that we would see and delight in your presence above all else. Help us now, Lord, as we sing, better, you're better than anything, anyone, anywhere else, God. Thank you for Jesus who has primed us to sing his praises. Make us faithful now as we do in Jesus' name.